Bonne de Gion, Bonne de Gessai, Croeso in Darleth Goffa Gwynalf. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our Gwynalf Memorial Lecture. Am I too loud? No, no? thank you. Okay, it's just, it's just the shirt I'm wearing. No? <laughs> <coughs> right. Um, Gai ddechrau trwy ddiolch i ddau o'n heilodau ffyddlon a gweithgar. Uh, Mike Jenkins am gael y syniad yn y lle gyntaf ac i gespain am greu y portreiad hyfryd hwn o'r dyn i hun. Okay. So I'd like to start by thanking two of our um, members, Mike Jenkins for hatching this idea in the first place and to our local and very talented artist Gus Payne for creating this wonderful portrait of the man himself. Now then, <clears throat> I, I can't go on without uh, saying a little bit about um, the highlights of 2019 because as we all know 2020 didn't happen at all really did it? Um, I can't remember why but uh, um, there were marches obviously planned for last year, but I think it's fair to say that 2019 was our first year of indie love, uh, where, you know, marches were like buses in that you wait a lifetime for one to come along and then you get three in the space of four fantastic months. Um, and all of them were significant and groundbreaking for different reasons. Um, the first, of course, Cardiff, on a bright and breezy Saturday in May, set the ball rolling, where the hopes, fears and pre-March predictions shared over nervy pints in the pen and wig couldn't have prepared us for what followed. <clears throat> Our definition of a decent turnout trebled. Then, from Victoria Dock, the stunning spectacle of a scarlet serpent of bodies spearing its way through the walled town, its twin red fangs, Anibaniaeth and independence, displayed with a grin from Castell Carnarvon to spellbound spectators below. Mahin and amazing was the mantra of the masses. We in Merthyr knew before Carnarvon that we would be next and I will be forever in awe of the skills, determination and ideas that my colleagues brought to the task of planning and delivering the Merthyr March. Dwi'n hollol gredinol ein bod ni fel cenedl ar lwybr didroi'n ôl wrth i'r wobr fawr o anibyniaeth a chymru rydd ddod yn agosach gyda phob dydd, pob addewid sy'n cael eu dorri, pob myth sy'n cael eu chwalu, a phob dadl sy'n cael ei wrth brofi, mae llygaid y genedl yn troi fesil pen tuag at weledigaid sy'n cefni ar dlodi ac anobaith trwy gynnig gobaith. I'm totally convinced that as a nation we're now locked onto a course that is taking us to the ultimate prize of independence and of free Wales with every broken promise, every myth that's busted, every bogus argument that's disproved, our people are increasingly turning their backs on hopelessness and poverty in favour of a vision of hope. Ni newydd trwy newid a narrative. With the support of the people of Merthyr, we plan to make this Gwyn Alf Lecture an annual event, forming the headline to a year-long programme of events involving schools and community groups to create and host debates, competitions and definitely harness the storytelling powers of our local historians to inspire a passion for history in our young people and perhaps on submission of a winning essay be able to offer a Gwynalf scholarship annually to our brightest young stars. And so to today's lecture. No one who was there on the square or who subsequently watched the footage and heard his speech can doubt the perfectly pitched power of his words or the potency to trigger fundamental change. At a time when Yes Cymru membership stood at 2000, almost as though he'd seen the script for what was ahead, Ed said, we need numbers. 
And with a huge growth in membership, currently nine times higher than than that figure, the whole nation replied, enough said, Ed. Hawdd cynnetan ar hyn aelwyd, ac mae'r ddwy flynedd diwethaf wedi profi heb unrhyw amheuaeth, nid yn unig mae'r tân yng nghyn, mae'r aelwyd yn wenfflam. Friends, to give our inaugural uh, Yes Cymru Merthyr Tydfil Gwynalf lecture, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Ed Butler. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, everybody, for a Merthyr welcome, warm as ever. Um, it is an honour and a, a privilege to be asked to give the inaugural Gwynalf Lecture. Um, it may be the first, but it's, um, it's a bit like the AstraZeneca. It, it comes in two doses. We had a go in, in January. Let's call it the dress rehearsal. And now we are here for real. Um, in the light of um, what's happened between then and now, let's say Wales winning the Six Nations, the Lions, the Euros, the Wales elections, hmm, catching COVID, um, I've decided to rewrite the whole thing. I think, uh, you know, in the year that's been, it sort of changes your perspective slightly, and maybe it's um, introduced uh, a little caution. Um, we are here to, to build a picture as best we can of, of what might be one day for Wales, but when it comes to building pictures, I am, I am conscious of this, this caution. I, I, I blame my wife, who, who said to me just as I was leaving to come here, she said, remember where you are. Keep it straightforward. None of your whimsy. You're in Merthyr. I also blame a- Angela Merkel. Um, I am conscious that um, after 16 years as Chancellor of Germany, she is stepping down, and th- there, is a, there is to be a contest to see who succeeds her. And by their own admission, the, the candidates for the job are dull and boring. By the, they boast that they are dull and boring. I think the Germans, better than anybody on earth, know that um, not for them is, 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 is populism and all the, all the, the hiding of, of, a, of a dangerous right-wing ideology behind buffoonery. So they do caution. And I, I, maybe I've sort of caught the whiff of, of caution in all this. Um, the Germans say it thus, when the, the, their former Chancellor Helmut Schmidt in, back in the 70s said, if you have visions, you should go and see a doctor. So <laughs> I am also conscious at the very same time that this is, this is Gwynalf. I, I feel Gwynalf on my shoulder, not whispering, but sort of thundering in my ear. There is a nation to be built, Ed. And I, Gwynalf, I hear you. Son Simon, I, I see you, and thank you for, 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 for being here. I, I, I shall do my best to set caution to one side. It is also a question of, I, I question my, my credentials to, to, to be here. I am, I am the son of English parents who, um, who came to Wales after, after the Second World War, and, and, and even when they landed in Wales, they. they we made it no further than Monmouth. And, and Monmouth is not Mirtha. And Monmouth is what they say to me every time I go to Parker Scarlet's Monmouth Sir Eddie Butler. Well, Sir Vanmi, not very Welsh at all then. And I am conscious of that. But um, my father w- was, I think, three years older than, than Gwynalf. And, and uh, he would have been 17 at the outbreak of the Second World War, and he would have been 20, 21 when he was seconded from, from Birmingham University to go and work in the RAF Bomber Command in, in, in High Wycombe, to work as a scientist on, on, on radar. Um, and uh, 
He worked in particular around the time of 1944 on what was called window, which was the, the dropping of, of a sort of aluminium litter. Uh, planes would go circling, advancing very slowly at the speed of ships, dropping this aluminium litter to make it appear to German radar that there was a fleet coming their way towards northern France, not Normandy. Uh, I think he admitted it wasn't entirely successful, but just say that half a, half a, half a dozen panzer tanks stayed more in the Calais region than, than went down to Normandy, then maybe it helped a tiny bit in, in Gwynalf, who must have been a teenager in the Battle of Normandy. It, and it was the most terrifying campaign. The, the casualties in the bocage of Normandy were as, were as heavy as, as any there has been in, in warfare. For, and that included you know, Waterloo and the Somme. Normandy was, was right up there, so it, it, it came with absolute peril. My father, after the war, he, he met my mum in, um, in Bomber Command, uh, and together after the war they came, they came to Wales to work in, in a, the new factory in Pontypool, British Nylon Spinners. It was a, a co-venture between ICI of Britain and DuPont of America, and it was... Uh, it was an attempt to, to look beyond the industrial age of, of Wales that had been and what might be in the future. And I suppose it was a fresh start on many fronts. If you think of, of Hoover coming to Merthyr with a view to what comes after the heavy industry that has made the towns we know. Uh, there was the, the, the TikTok factory that went to Ustred Gunlice. You know, so we, there are examples of Wales post-war looking beyond the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and we shall return to the nylon, as it was called, the factory in, in Pontypool. But for the moment, will you let me worry a little bit about my name? I am, I am Edward. I, am, I, I should have been Edwin. Edwin, my, my grandfather's name was Edwin. He was a steel worker in, in Scunthorpe, and his first son, was an Edwin who became a professional footballer before the war and after the war with Grimsby Town. And I was going to be Edwin, but my mother sort of cooled on the name Edwin and, and decided I would be Edward, which is awkward. Awkward Edward. Because Edward I came to Wales as the, the Plantagenet king who just launched an all-out assault on the Welsh and defeated them and built the castles that we so admire for their, for their splendor nowadays, but they were built then as a statement to say, look who's in charge now, and it wasn't the Welsh. And Edward VIII came to Merthyr and said, in the second decade of, of recession and depression after the First World War and just before the Second. Edward VIII came to Merthyr and said, something should be done. Unfortunately, he abdicated. <laughs> his love of Wallace Simpson and his love of Adolf Hitler, let's face it, proved a little bit stronger than his desire to do anything for Merthyr after all. Uh, I sort of find myself mulling over names. Harold and mulling on this, this vision of, of what we might do about, about Wales. And, of course, if you're trying to build a picture of what might be in the future, you have to have a reference point of what Wales has been in the past. And it, it, it struck me that there's only, only once has Wales ever been a united kingdom. Only once. It, it, it was in 1055, for a brief period, when... Griffith ap Llewellyn was king of all Wales. He, he, he was the king of Gwynedd, and then he became the king of Powys, and then he became the king of all Wales until 1063. He, he, he married a, a Saxon noblewoman, Ealdgith, and for seven brief years, seven and a bit brief years, Wales enjoyed relative peace. <laughs> we were always fighting. It just goes with the 
goes with the entire history of, of, of Wales, that there was squabbling and fighting, but in, in relative terms it was quite peaceful. Until, until Harold Godwinson came along, defeated Griffith, and um, uh, in Snowdonia, defeated him, chopped his head off, took it to show to the king of the Saxons, Edward the Confessor, Edward, <laughs> and he not only took the head of the king of all Wales, he also took the wife too. So Ealdgith went from being the queen of all Wales to being Harold Godwinson's wife. And in 1066, Harold Godwinson becomes King Harold, successor to Edward the Confessor, king of all England, only briefly. Because in 1066, in the month of October, of course, he goes to the Battle of Hastings, gets the arrow in the eye, loses to William the Conqueror, and, um, and that's the end of the Saxons as rulers of England. And I, and I can see everybody, oh my God, he's gone back a thousand years, which is a long time. But if you, if you think that England sets its start date by 1066, the, the last time Britain was inf invaded by a foreign force successfully. Well, it seems to me fair enough that we, we can go back a thousand years in Wales and touch briefly on our moment as a United Kingdom and make the point, which is hugely important, that the further back you can go and find Wales united, not necessarily as a kingdom, but united as a country with a common language, namely Welsh, going back even further than that, the further you can go back and show that despite a thousand years of attempts to eradicate that language and that culture, then you can make the point that modern Wales is distinct and it remains intact, which is important. Of course, Harold, the name, lives on. We have uh, Harry Wilson, youngest player ever to play on the wing for Wales. Born in Wrexham, Liverpool, um, currently at Fulham. And, <coughs> excuse me, from, from, from my playing days in rugby, we had Elgin Rees uh, of Neath, the Lions, at Wales. And, and, and we called him Harry because he was, he is, Harold Elgin Rees. And Harry is, of course, the Welsh name for Henry, as in Harry Tidir, Henry Tudor, who, who simply became King of All England. 1485, lands in Dale in Pembrokeshire, finds an army along the way to Bosworth Field, defeats Richard III, the last great battle of the Battle of the Roses, the House of Lancaster wins, He's got a bit of a dodgy claim on the England throne, but when you've won the decisive battle of the War of Roses, <laughs> the throne is, is there for the taking. And, and there we have what a role reversal it, it is. We've got Harold coming to Wales and putting an end to the one time we had a kingdom in Wales, and Harry Tidir arriving and becoming the King of England, which means that suddenly... The Welsh are in charge, aren't we? Well, not really, because Henry the Seventh son, Henry the Eighth, he of the many wives, in the, 30, in the 1530s and the 1540s, and uh, I suppose there are there are sort of re reasons why he does it, why he introduces what are called the Act of Union. I think it's to do with there were people who committed serious crimes in England and, and, and nipped across the border into Wales where they were <laughs> given refuge. It's, it is a very Welsh thing. Oh, come on in, but yeah, we, we know you've uh, done something bad over Offa's Dyke, but um, no, come and have some refuge. Cash will do, you know, sovereigns, groats, you know, shillings, testoons will take 
any currency in Wales. I think it irked central government in London that Wales was this sort of slightly dodgy Costadel crime of its day. And, and when you want to introduce draconian laws, then as now, you can always fall back on, on law and order. And anyway, the, Henry VIII introduced the Acts of Union, which simply stated that Wales was no longer Welsh. It was simply a part of England on all fronts. The civil service, the, the formation of shires, local government, everything in Wales was simply a tinier version of what happened in England. And, and, and this is important. This is probably as important as anything that Wales simply became an extension of England. And maybe that would have been the way things were. Wales by back then was so rural and so remote that there'd have been the law set out in black and white and there would have been the reality on the ground that Wales carried on just speaking Welsh and being culturally distinct and, and, and getting away with it. There was a role to play that the further west you were in, in Britain, in the age of sail, the, the, the more you had a role to play because simply we were sending boats out into the Atlantic and it, it, it saved days if you were further west. So there was the shipbuilding in Cardigan and there was Pembroke, the dock, obviously important. But essentially, in the centuries that followed Henry VIII, and, <coughs> excuse me, Wales was, uh, well, it was just somewhere to pass through on, on the way to Ireland to get the mail to Ireland, to get the Irish MPs back and forth between, between Dublin and London. Ireland was, was more important, it was more rebellious, it was more troublesome. And Wales was as it was until the Industrial Revolution. I, and this is the, the turning point, especially here in Merthyr. You know, it, 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 is, it is what defines life here ever since but I'm just drawn to I was watching this program the other day on the making of canals I, oh, I love canals as as communication speeds up and life gets more frenzied I, I find myself wishing to drift along at the speed of a canal boat and um, I was watching this program and there was a, a a surveyor called William Smith and he was he was he worked in Somerset on uh, I'm just going down mines, not all of them just coal mines, all, all sorts of metal mines and coal mines, to, to examine the strata and to see, I suppose it was a safety check in those days, and he also was the surveyor of canals and he spent a lot of time examining the great blocks of limestone that were used to, to build locks along the canal. And, and the more he studied rocks, the more he became interested in, in fossils and, and geology. And in, in 1815, he... He produced this geological map of Great Britain, and it sounds very dull. But if you if you look at it and if you sort of soften it with, if you take your glasses off, it does it for me. That you have this, it looks a bit like an MRI scan. It's very colourful and it's and it's thin. And I just imagine if you're a bigger doctor looking at this MRI scan of William Smith, and you go, I'm a bit worried about that that black mass there. And that black mass, of course, is the South Wales coalfield. And, 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 and there it is. And it, it, it has had it's such a, an important part in, in the history of Wales. And, and not all of it. I mean, it, it, it opened up all these opportunities. But it also came with this, with this sort of sense of doom, which again is it's a... It's a it's a, it's a very Welsh thing. I mean, for, for, for example, William Smith, who wasn't Welsh at all, but he, 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 he identified the black mass that was to be exploited. And he, he ended up, I mean, he was, he was hailed by scientists like um, Charles Darwin in later years. And he was just, he was lauded as one of the great architects of, of scientific advancement. But for the moment, in 1815, he went, he went straight to debtor's jail. So... You know, there's, there's this sense of doom, and I, I'm drawn to these, these characters who have doom 
<laughs> built into their into their careers. For example, just just down the road in in, in Blind Avenue, you've, you've got Sidney Gilchrist Thomas and, and his cousin Percy Carlyle Gilchrist, and these two guys they they would come together over a weekend, and and in a little cottage on the moors above Blind Avenue, they 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 behaved like alchemists trying to discover the secret of making steel. By then, Wales had the, um, the Bessemer converter, the, the, the great invention for, that instead of we could, we could upgrade from making iron, we could now make steel. But there was a problem that you needed, you needed high-grade ore to make steel because the phosphorus content tended to make the steel too brittle. And the race was on to, to find out how to how to get rid of phosphorus in the, in the Bessemer process. And these two guys, the, 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 the Gilchrist Thomas, they worked in their little alchemist's cottage. And, uh, and they got there. They found, they found the solution. They had a little bit of funding from the Blynavon Iron Company. And, and when, they, when they discovered that if you put a a bricks made of limestone into the, into the converter, you absorbed the phosphorus and out came high-grade steel, and they sold it immediately to Andrew Carnegie, the, the Scottish uh, steelmaker who just, you know, who made it huge in America, the Carnegie Hall. It's all named after Andrew Carnegie, and, um, and of course, there were the riches came with it, but there, by, by experimenting in the cottage, phosphorus is, is, is not good for you, and, and, and Sidney Gilchrist Thomas just ended up dying of... Lung disease in Paris in his early 30s. And um, the, the element of doom goes with the, um, the outrageous opportunities. I mean, here with the ironworks of Merthyr and the, the crochets and, the, and Josiah Guest and all the great people who, or perhaps not so great, I mean, it is open to debate whether, whether the, it was a exploitation were they were they villains in the history or were they were they people who who gave as much as as they took there's one other person it's almost a debate to be had in its own right but uh, there, there is one I'm, I'm, I don't think the crochets have particularly gone down in history that well I think I think Josiah Guest is, is viewed in a slightly more kindly light but but if you pitch them against Thomas Powell then they are positively angelic. Uh, Thomas Powell was, um, he, he was born in Monmouth, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, and, he, and he, he was slightly unusual. Uh, up until his time, there, there tended to be single owners of mines. And, and then he, he, he bought up mines in groups. And he became fantastically wealthy. And he built the, the Dufferin Powell Steam Coal Company. And... Uh, and he just coined it big time. And um, as a wedding gift to his son, Thomas Powell Jr., he built a house in Newport called Calder House. And Calder House is now the, the original part of the Celtic Manor Resort. And uh, it was built for his son and his wife, who were going to live in there. And Thomas uh, Powell Jr. and his wife set off after their wedding to Abyssinia, now Ethiopia, on safari. And of course, going on safari back then wasn't, wasn't to go and paint pretty pictures of wildebeest. It was to get your elephant gun out and blaze away until you had a pile of tusks as high as this theatre. But anyway, Thomas Powell Jr., instead of enjoying elephant hunting, disappears without trace. At first, they thought he, he and his wife and his son and his, and his entourage of servants were eaten by lions. But it, it seems that he just blundered into some, I don't know, some local dispute and um, were hacked to pieces, never to be seen again. In a way, you sort of, you reap what you sow, that uh, if, if, as Thomas Powell Sr., who was a singularly unpleasant employer, that um, if, you, if you show a such a flagrant disregard for, for the plight of others, then it tends to come back and bite you because not only did he lose one son, his junior, on safari, 
He lost his other son, Walter, in even more bizarre circumstances. Thomas Walter Powell set off by hot air balloon from Bath one day in the company of two friends, and on a friendly breeze from the northeast, they, they made it to Exeter, where they were suddenly struck by a much more ferocious southwesterly, which blew them towards Dorset. And as they approached the coast, they decided, well, if the best thing we can do here, we'd better land. But landing in a storm proved quite difficult, and they hit the ground hard, and one of Walter Powell's friends was thrown out of the basket. The balloon basket bounces into the air, whereupon the other friend jumps out, breaks his leg on landing, but is generally safe. Walter Powell, in the basket, waves cheerily to the crowd below and disappears out into the channel, never to be seen again. It, it, um, the Industrial Revolution, on a, more, on a more general theme, was a, was a super spreader event for Welshness. It, um, it attracted this, this, this surge of employment in, in the mines, in the ironworks. It, 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 it needed many hands, and, and, and people came from all over rural Wales to work in, in the new industries. And with them, they brought the language. Where Welsh was spoken throughout these, these valleys, which had never been densely populated before. And so Welsh spread. But such was the demand for, for labour that it started to come in from all over, elsewhere. And, and very quickly, English became the dominant language spoken, the balance of language and, and almost of culture shifted away from Welsh. And there was a need to find a, a symbol, an expression of Welshness, now that the language was not really so much available. And as the 19th century progressed, it, it came in the form of, of, of rugby union. This is where the, the attachment between the Welsh name nation and the, and the sport of, of rugby started, that we need somehow, I don't know what it is, but we do need symbols of identity, whether it's you know, the, the daffodil, the leek, what makes us what we are, and, and, and rugby played its part. It was, it was quite a delicate balance to begin with, because when, when, when rugby union arrived in Wales, it was as gentlemanly as, as anything that came from the playing fields of the public schools of England. It was, it was a very elite sport. Um, Newport, Cardiff, Swansea, even Llanelli were decidedly toffee-nosed about rugby union. And the, the good news for the future of the sport was they, they simply got thumped by everybody. And it wasn't until Wales actually embraced the more rugged um, style of play of the Valley Clubs, and in particular what they called the Ronda Forwards, that we, we, we found this balance between artistry in the backs and thuggery in the forwards. And it was the perfect balance, of course. And Wales, at the turn of the, the 20th century, in the, entered their first golden period of, of rugby. And, um, you know, France weren't involved at the time, but to, and to win the Triple Crown was everything. No such thing as the Grand Slam, but the Triple Crown was the equivalent, and it was much cherished. And Wales in the 1900s just simply stormed through. And, of course, it, in 1905, Wales beat the All Blacks, and it was the first time that him, Lard Van Haddai, had been heard. The All Blacks did their haka, and the crowd responded by singing the anthem for the first time, and it, and it became this great impassioned symbol of, of what being Welsh was all about and the, the winning try was, was scored by Teddy Morgan and I, I only mentioned Teddy Morgan because of course he was Edward Morgan so it's a, a Welsh Edward that done good. <laughs> Rugby uh, has this hold on us. I remember when I, when I first joined Pontypool the, the, the wonderful Ray Prosser said to me, Edward, he said, Rugby in Pontypool is much more than a game. Uh, and in a way, he was right. So that it, it, it shaped our lives and um, it, it defined the town of, uh, of Pontypool. But ultimately, it, 
it is only a game and there are greater forces at work. I remember in, in, in 1980, I was uh, fresh into the Welsh team and uh, we went to play in England. My second game was away in England, 1980. It went, it went down in history as the Paul Ringer game. It was, it was spectacularly violent. Even, even for somebody in, coming from Pontypool, I, it was a, 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 a very violent. <laughs> and um, it, it coincided, the match in 1980 coincided with a steel strike back home. And, and so you can imagine in, in the dressing room, it, 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 the, the, the talk was just, it's almost cliched now, but the talk was about the English do this to that to us, they take that from us, and we'd wait them and let's get out there and smash them. And, uh, and um, the game went its way. We, we, we lost by a point. I, I, uh, but afterwards, I remember the, the, very, the next day, I, talking to the lads, I said, all that stuff about the distinct defiance of Wales in the face of England. Um, is, it, is it heartfelt? Is it serious? Oh, no, it's just part of the theatre, just all part of the drama of the weekend. And I, I remember feeling distinctly disappointed that, that somehow there was, you know, it's like, um, it's like Christmas lights or you know, a mothering Sunday card. You, you bring out your Welsh defiance and you put it on display briefly and then you, you, you take it down again. And it, there's something something hollow about all this. And so this rugby, in a way, is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a false symbol of what Wales is all about. So, so it, it begs the question then, well, what are we all about? And where are we? I, um, I, joined, I joined BBC Wales in, in 1984. And uh, it was the year, of course, of the miners' strike. And I would... I would come down from Monmouthshire and, and join the M4 at the Cauldre, where the Celtic Manor is, and, and every day I would, I would go past the coal convoy. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember the, the coal convoy, but it was the supply of coal from the coal terminal in, in, in Aberavon, which was built to obviously supply the giant steelworks at Port Talbot, but it was diverted during the miners' strike to go to carry coal to Llamwern. And uh, it started out as a, as, a, as a small group of lorries in absolutely pristine condition because the hauliers that were prepared to take the coal, they were handsomely re rewarded by, by the Thatcher government. And this coal convoy, which began as these immaculate new trucks, then grew and grew and became more and more battered they had grills over all their windows and they bore the scars of paint and bricks that were thrown at them, thrown at them along the way. And it was, in the end, it was a mile long. Half a mile of it was the police convoy. And uh, I remember it, it, it was a sort of, it was like a, a barometer of the strike just going past the convoy every day. Every effort made to keep the coal convoy going, to keep Lamwern open. Of course, nowadays, if you wanted to stop anything at the Brynglas tunnels, you'd just let the weight of traffic do it for you. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's very strange that Cole's days were numbered long before it became the real villain in the, in the great debate of today, you know, climate change. You know, it, 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 it was doomed anyway, but it, it just strikes me that it's funny how... We are prepared to sit in our cars at the Bringlass tunnels and listen to the debates on our car radios and burn fuel while coal is, is trashed as it is. Um, I, I do notice as well that we, traffic levels in this age of what we call transport decarbonisation are already back to pre-pandemic levels plus. It just, it's, it's remarkable, all those, all those sort of claims that, oh, life will never go back to how it was before. We're already having to re review all that. The minor strike was the sort of, f f f well, f as far as I sense, just being an observer of, of, of all this, was the last great protest. And even, even though it was uh, 
so n newsworthy and dramatic and, and in the end futile. It was not specifically a Welsh protest. It was just a, a protest by Welsh miners in the name of something more universal that... Uh, just like uh, all the other major protests in Welsh history, when you take the, the, the Merthyr Uprising, it was, it was not in the name of Welsh independence. It was simply a, a desire, born of a desire for, for improved working conditions. The Chartists marching on, on Newport from Merthyr, from Nantaglo and from, from Pontypool, they were, it was all about universal suffrage and a, 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 the, the Charter demanding rights for, for for everybody, and just one sort of brief observation on the sort of the subplot of of Monmouth and Merthyr. The Chartists set out from Merthyr to go to Newport, and they are taken from Newport to go to Monmouth to be put on trial. <laughs> you know, it's just just the way things are in Monmouth and Merthyr life. Um, but. The minor strike, I said, it, it was in vain, and it, and it coincided with the nylon in Pontypool. Shut, closed, hoovers, gone. The TikTok in Astra Gunlice, gone, closed. And we are now the poorest region in Northern Europe. And this is set against the UK still having the sixth largest economy on Earth. USA, China, Germany, Japan, India have, uh, have overtaken us. The UK, I don't know, the UK. When my, when my parents came to Wales at the end of the Second World War, they were, they were firm in their belief that, um, that there was such a thing as Great Britain. My mother was on duty on, in Bomber Command on the night that her, her twin brother Raymond was killed in in the Nuremberg Raid, it was one of the great disasters of, of, of the Allied war effort that they, they sent out hundreds of Lancaster and Wellington bombers to, to bomb Nuremberg and they were promised cloud cover the whole way and it turned into a starlit sky and they were just taken out one by one. And there were more, more, more RAF men killed on, on one night in the Nuremberg Raid than there were in the entire Battle of Britain. And... Um, my mum was working when her, her brother Raymond, he, they, he was in a Lancaster and they were, they were just trying to get back on the beacon that would take them home. They dropped their bombs and they'd missed by five miles and they just collided with a Halifax and, uh, and he's buried in, in Luxembourg. Uh, but those were the sacrifices that were made by, by that generation because they were fueled by this, by this spirit that they were fighting against something truly dreadful. The, the, the Nazi ideology had to be resisted at all costs. And that meant that sort of Great Britain was in their soul. You know, they were all in it together. And, and there are still people now who, who try to peddle this notion of a, of a Great Britain. Global Britain, says Prime Minister Boris Johnson. But the truth of, of life nowadays <clears throat> is that Wales, supposedly part of Great Britain, is simply neglected. We, um, I, I have to come on now to the Barnet formula. Uh, and I, I, I sense whenever I mention the Barnet formula that eyes glaze over. And, but it's, it's important that I, and I for, bear with me if I, if I, Try and explain the Barnet formula one more time. Even it was it was it was formulated by a guy called Joel Barnet, and even he said after a few years in the seventies, he said, "No, no, no, I didn't design this formula as a, as a long-term solution. You know, it's, it simply wasn't designed for that." But fifty years later, it's still what we use to fund Wales from from central from central government, and um, it works like this. I, there's, there's an Englishman and he lives in a castle and it's surrounded by a moat and on the other side of the moat there's a village full of foreigners and the Englishman is, is he's getting in his, in his dotage he's getting a bit irascible and tetchy and he decides he wants nothing more to do with the villagers on the other side of the moat. 
He pulls up his drawbridge and says, I'm going to be on my own from now on, but it's okay. I, I, have, my, I have my dogs to feed. I have, there's plenty for me to do in the castle. And um, he's, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a lowly aristocrat. He's a, he's a baronet. And um, in, his, in the time that he now has to himself, he, he, he works on a formula for feeding his, his animals, which he keeps in various parts of, of the castle. And he calls it the baronet formula. And every day he, he takes his tweed jacket and he fills the right-hand pocket with all the biscuits of his baronet formula. And he goes up to the north tower and he knocks on the door and inside there's this little Westie, this little Highland Terrier. And the Terrier barks furiously at the, at the English son as he, as he pulls out a biscuit and throws it quickly inside. He says, come on now, give me a break. Let's be friends. And the growl just gets deeper and the dog starts advancing towards the door. He says, now come on. He throws another biscuit in and the barking just increases. And in the end, he just takes a handful of biscuits and throws them inside the, the door just as the Highland Terrier launches itself. And the, just in the nick of time, the Englishman shuts the door and says, oh dear God. And he goes down to the gazebo in the garden, where he keeps a, a Belfast boxer dog, complete with bowler hat. And uh, it's a weird one. The, the, the Belfast boxer's a bit strange. It, it, it was okay. It used to have a companion dog. It used to have a lovely Irish wolfhound as a companion. But the Irish wolfhound wandered off years ago and was last seen out amongst the villages on the other side of the moat. But he's stuck now with this bulldog. And he looks at the bulldog and he says, I need you, I'm, I need your bark. You have a fine bark, let's hear it. And he throws in the biscuit from, from his pocket and the bulldog just stares at him with his slightly cross-eyed look and says nothing. And the Englishman says, come on, bark for me, and throws in another biscuit and, the, and a little growl comes out of the, the bulldog and the Englishman says, oh, for heaven's sake, bark. And the bulldog looks at him, and the boxer dog looks at him, and instead of barking, it just emits this huge fart. And the Englishman, oh dear God, and he just picks up a whole handful of biscuits and throws them in, shuts the door before the stink overwhelms him. And he goes down to his, this little outhouse he's got on the side of the kitchen. And in, in the kitchen, lying on some straw in the far corner, is a lovely old Welsh collie. And the Englishman goes in and he says, Ah, oh, golly, lovely to see you. Always save the best to last. And he reaches in his pocket. And he's got one biscuit left. And he takes the biscuit behind his back. He breaks it in half. And he just throws the Welsh Collie half a biscuit. He says, Ah. Oh. And the Welsh Collie wags its tail. That's the Barnet formula. <laughs> Of course, the collie did have one snarl left in it, Brexit. When, when Oswald Mosley, leader of the British Union of Fascists, the Black Shirts, decided in a time of depression, recession, that Wales would be a ripe recruiting ground for his outfit, he came down and he, and he tried it. He tried to recruit in Swansea in 34, and he tried to recruit in Tonopandi in 1936. And on both occasions, he was simply chased out of town. And now, when it comes to Brexit, Wales voted decisively to follow the line set by an extreme wing of the Conservative Party. And this Conservative Party, what with the loss of Labour seats in Scotland to the Scottish Nationalists, this Conservative Party could remain in power ad infinitum. Now, we, we, we're almost as guilty of having a one-party system of our own. You know, we have Labour as our devolved government in the Senate. I like the word Senate. I think it's got a, it's got a nice ring to it. But we have the one-party state in there, and you, it, it, it is tempting to, to make the accusation that the Labour 
devolved government. He's like he's like the Vichy government of, of wartime France. That it's a it's a government of collaboration. I, uh, I'm not I'm not going to give in to the temptation because I think I think Mark Drakeford is. Um, he, I, I heard the interview he gave when he said that when he was in his teens and he was faced with this this crossroads decision between when he was formulating his own vision of where he wanted his politics to go or where he was being taken by his politics, he was, he was caught between the choice between socialism or nationalism. And he chose socialism, which of course is a mass movement which, which um, embraces solidarity. You need everybody to be together. If you're going to challenge the elites, you need everybody to be together, which includes keeping the union of the United Kingdom together. And I remember he, he deliberately, I, th I think it was deliberately, he deliberately used the word nationalism. And I think, with all due respect to the Scottish Nationalist Party, I think nationalism is one of those words that you can just hear the, the Conservatives saying it with a sneer, that nationalism comes with this. It is, it is a tainted word. It, the, 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 the Serbian militias who... In, in the Balkan Wars, they were they were nationalists. General Franco of Spain was a nationalist, and nationalism is all about declaring your ethnic group superior to others. And I honestly don't think that applies in Wales. I don't think we are making any claims on superiority over anybody. I am I am not a nationalist. I am I am a seeker of independence. And I think it's important that, you know, I'm sure Mark Drakeford almost surprised himself by how successful he was when he could act independently in the health crisis. That Wales in general, history will look back, I think, on, on, on how Wales handled the pandemic and, and be seen in, in glowing terms, acting independently of, of the populist Westminster government, where chaos reigns. So we've mentioned the word independence and I can just hear oh he's a soft man Wales is too small the public sector is such a drain on everything what would the currency be the country is simply too small well we're the we're the same size as Slovenia um, Slovenia is doing very well and you don't, if you had a vote in Slovenia and say, would you like to go back to being part of the old Yugoslavia? I don't think that would be a very popular move at all. In fact, if you asked any country that broke away from the superior neighbour, I don't think anybody would ever vote to go back. How many, how many countries of the Commonwealth would go back to being under the direct rule of Westminster? Ireland, of course, aren't in the Commonwealth, but do you think anybody in Ireland longs for the days of being under Westminster rule? I think would be, would be fine, because you make it work. I, I am not an economist, but you don't have a revolution driven by economists. The second thing is that those that say it, it couldn't work, they're absolutely right. We, we, we could never stand on our own two feet as long as we remain what we were made by Henry VIII's Acts of Union. As long as we have a system that makes us on all fronts just a part of England, then we're doomed. It simply would, will not work, would not work. We have to find a way of reinventing ourselves as a small country, doing things our way. And how is this going to be? The, the young, above all, must be mobilised on the grounds of the themes of today that matter. Climate change, sustainability, the production of, of good food and good energy. The, the young have their own means of communicating. You know, it's all to do with social media, and I'm, I'm very conscious of the perils, the, the, the threats that, that come with social media. But I think the young have better filters. They can filter out the rubbish and the nonsense far better than, than people of my generation. I, you know, I'm, I fear that we'll, we'll never win the propaganda battle as long as we, we just fall back on all the, 
the outlets that that control our media lives. You know, did you just think of who runs the press in Britain? Well, it's a, a clutch of, of right-wing oligarchs. Um, even the dear old BBC. I mean, when on the day of the march in Merthyr, you looked at the BBC report the next day and it said, hundreds march in Merthyr. And you say, well, that, I'm, I'm sorry, that is just a, a deliberate falsification. And you realise who... Who is representing the establishment and who really will go with a drive for change? Wales has never been united. History shows that, apart from that brief period under Griffith Ap Llewellyn. We can turn that to our advantage. There's nothing which says you have to all bow down to central control. If you think of the places that already work, they're all working independently. Triorki High Street, Abergavenny reinventing itself with a food festival and just being dynamic, Llandelo and Narbeth. And, you know, you've got to be able to say to those places that are deeply suspicious of, of control by Cardiff, fine, Carnarvon, go and do your own thing. You know, you, you are... You have absolute license to, to, to be part of a, a loose confederation of, of places in Wales. We, we, we have a blank canvas. We can write it as we want. And the only absolute we need is transparency in everything. If we are to have a constitution, it must be absolutely written in black and white that every penny must be openly accounted for. There's no denying that you know, with, with, with power comes greed and with greed comes corruption and there will always be a problem and people will pounce on, on the slightest thing in a new country trying to go it alone. But as long as we keep everything transparent, and why wouldn't we? What have we got to hide? What do we need a secret service for? What secrets do we need to keep? We are simply open to all and we're, we're open for business. But how do we connect this, this, this vision? See, I'm, I'm doing the vision thing here. I'm, I'm feeling decidedly un-German. How do we connect the future with the weary Brexit voting Wales that is still a majority? Um, I go back to William Smith, the, 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 the geologist. And, and, and through him, I, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. He, um, he introduced me to something called the Neath Disturbance. Having played, having played for years at the Knoll, I, I, I know all about the Neath Disturbance. But there was, back in, 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 in the great Paleozoic time of, of, of massive upheaval on Earth, there was this thing called the Neath Disturbance, which is when strata of rock press against each other, and such are the forces that they rise up and form and form mountain ranges. And through the Neath disturbance, we have the Vale of Neath, mountains either side, and it stretches all the way up, sort of pointing at Hereford, and then forming the Black Mountains around Abergavenny, and then the, the South Wales coalfield, the Black Mass on, on William Smith's um, map, geological map. And on one side, you have industrial Wales, ex-industrial Wales. And on the other side, you have, you have the beauty, the splendour of the Black Mountains. And, and if you've got the, 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 the Groyne Valley, the, you come to the Groyne Vau Reservoir. It's sort of hidden way up on the other side of Fantoni Abbey. You go over and you come to the Groyne Vau Reservoir. It's 1,750 feet up in the air, and, and it was built to feed Abitillary of all places. So, so it, it, the water goes down and it goes back up through the Coiti mountain to feed Abitillary at the, well, not quite at the head of the valley, but not, not far from the head of the Ebu Valley. And, um, and that's what happened. And, uh, and there we have Wales connected, if, if now only, only symbolically. We're back to symbols because the water got a little peaty in the groin of our reservoir, and, 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 and Welsh Water decided that it was, it was impracticable to, to clean the water, and so it's decommissioned. 
It just sits there. 400 million gallons of clean, fresh water. A little brown, but it's good brown. You know, it's Guinness brown. And it's, it's there. And um, it just strikes me that it's... Water is going to be the most precious re resource on Earth. We are a land of untapped splendor, riches. We are different and we are distinct. We are connected and we are small. In Germany, it's, it, you, they are cautious about their vision because they are Germany. They are leaders of, a, of the geopolitical world. They see everything in, in macro terms. We in Wales are not. We can and we, we must have our dreams. For me, the, the big day in Merthyr, all under one banner, Yes Cymru, the March for Independence, it was the most uplifting day of my life. So, I leave you with this. Cymru, small, beautiful and free. Thank you.